Hello, this is Leon Barman of Leon Barman Ministries. And I have an exciting teaching today uh, called that is titled Adam and Six Day Man. Adam and Six Day Man. And we will show how that Adam and Eve are actually separate from mankind that was created on the sixth day. We can call Adam and Eve eighth day man because they were created after the Sabbath, uh, God's first Sabbath, right? And six day man before. And we're not just picking on the uh, narrative in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, um, kind of missing how it's read. Most times, uh, you know, most most believers read it as one story with um, kind of a different focus or a, a repetition of what was covered in uh, Genesis chapter 1. And they see it as one uh, story, maybe a repeating of that story. Um, and before we get into that, I just want to welcome everyone, um, all my new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. Lord willing, there is going to be more content uh, being put out there. Uh, as I'll be doing a lot more... Um, Videos just based on things that, you know, God puts on my heart, uh, things that I feel in my spirit need to be said, you know, to the church. Um, any, you know, little lessons or teachings the Lord may give me. Uh, and these more in-depth teachings will still come about. Um, you know, they take a longer time to put together and, and everything, uh, a lot goes into it, um, you know, in terms of study and preparation. Um, so those, those will still happen, but, but I want to put out more content. So, uh, so look forward to that and please, you know, like this video. And if you're, you're not yet a subscriber, uh, I'd encourage you to subscribe, like, and share this video. And uh, just be blessed today, you know, get some coffee. Um, I don't think it'll be as long as my uh, pre-Adamite uh, teaching a um, couple videos back. <laughs> but uh, but it, there are a lot of notes. Um, and so here we go. <laughs> First, I want to say what this teaching is not, because... If this topic interests you and you do your, some uh, of your own research, which I, I would encourage people to do, though there's not a lot out there on this subject, there is some good stuff, uh, then there's some questionable stuff. Uh, so I want to say a couple disclaimers first. Um, what this teaching is not, separating Adam from six-day man, it's not another way of saying the serpent seed or uh, the Cainites versus the Sethites, you know, and, and um, there was actually some ugly racist type doctrines that came out um, uh, in the 18th century um, based on this teaching. Um, you know, the person claimed that, and you'll find modern versions of this today, you know, that uh, the Adam is you know, the white race and um, six-day man is all the um, minority races or the, you know, darker skin pigmentation uh, races and um, darker ethnicities. And, you know, that's uh, just an ugly uh, racist uh, theory, which I do not adhere to, because um, you'll find, you know, what is true with the Cainite theory, which would also became the basis of uh, uh, racist or root race theory. You know, uh, all the Cainites died out in the flood, you know, so all, there goes all your serpent seed, you know, it died out in the flood. 
Um, you know, there's a modern day teacher that claims Esau was of the, is of the serpent seed and Jacob is not. That's why God could hate him and, you know, all this nonsense. Uh, and the same is true of those who try to take the same similar angle with the six day man. Uh, basically, all of six day man died out in the flood. Uh, Adam's seed or the Sethites, if you will, survived the flood. OK, so every race you see now on planet Earth, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, uh, you know, Southeast Asian, you know, et cetera, et cetera are all descendants of Adam and Eve, all descendants of Seth, um, all descendants of Noah through Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, you know, if you, wanted to get, if you want to get into where uh, things divide up, that's between Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and uh, that's as far as we'll take that <laughs> at this time. Because we're teaching about Adam and Eve versus six-day man. So I'm going to launch into my text. Oh, another thing I want to point out before we go on is uh, this is also not a roundabout way of making room for prehistoric man, so-called, you know, in terms of uh, uh, caveman or Neanderthal man or, um, or any of the other prehistoric uh, versions of man that the Darwinians have uh, come out with. Uh, which a lot of them have proved have been disproven to be nothing more than, you know, uh, skeletal fossils of an ape or the tooth of a pig or et cetera, et cetera. So this is not that. This is not that. Um, so let's get into our text. You know, this is to say that <clears throat> God created mankind on the sixth day that God created mankind in his image and likeness. But that that was a more generalized creation compared to what God was going to do in the next chapter, which was to form a specific man and a specific woman, Adam and Eve. And or he formed Adam first and, and uh, later he formed Eve out of uh, his side, out of the rib of his side. And, um, and that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and Eve the breath of life, and man became a living soul, okay? And this was kind of different from what occurred with six-day man, okay? Though both are created in his image, and we're going to get into that, hopefully. So let's dive in. I think a lot of times I'll... Uh, simply make references to scripture instead of, you know, looking up everything. Um, perhaps that'll save us a little time. But we're going to relax and we're just going to teach this as it comes by the Spirit of God. So buckle up. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to start at verses 26 through 31, which is the end of the chapter. And we're going to compare that with chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 1 through 9 and verses 15 through 22, if you're taking notes out there, uh, if you're following along. But we will go to chapter 1 first, and beginning at verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, over all the earth, right? And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God uh, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. 
replenish points to pre-Adamites, <laughs> which we discussed not too long ago. So now mankind, uh, six-day man, is being tasked to replenish the earth, to repopulate the world, okay? And subdue it, subdue the earth, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Okay. Um, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat or for food. Yeah, there was some um, out there that claimed six-day man were all carnivores and Adam and Eve were, were vegetarians, you know, in the Garden of Eden. But, but here we see that God does say to subdue the earth, you know, including all the animals, but he basically gives them uh, vegetation to eat. So, so all of mankind originally were vegetarians before Noah's day. Okay, that's another sermon. Um, verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So he made all the other animals uh, vegetarians as well. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay? That's the sixth day. Now let's get into our next text. Chapter 2, 1 through 9, and verses 15 through 22 as well. But let's start. Chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Even though we saw six day men being created in the previous chapter. But there was a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But didn't he do that originally on um, the fifth day? You know, didn't God already create vegetation and, you know, so, you know, we're going to be seeing these things here. <clears throat> The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. See, we're talking about the Garden of Eden now. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so let's drop down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I taught on this, the tree of discernment, um, thou shalt not eat of it, 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, for I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, which we thought he did on the sixth day, right? And every fowl of the air, fifth day, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Okay. Uh, Oops. To verse 22. Verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Remember Christ's side was pierced and forthwith came there out blood and water. And out of his side came the church, his bride, Ephesians 5. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Okay, so we'll stop there. So it's been long noted that there's these differences between the two narratives of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis 2. Chapter 2 regarding the creation of mankind, and some have conjectured that there's different authors uh, taking place in Genesis, or perhaps different uh, creation stories or mythos are being pieced together. Um, But we believe that the scriptures are God breathed, inspired by the by God through the Holy Spirit, and that everything is in the Bible for a reason and a purpose. Okay. So why, you know, <clears throat> we want to note, uh, first of all, that there are eight distinctions between Adam and six-day man. And our our second point, whatever is not covered in these eight distinctions, will answer three objections in our second point. And then we'll finish up with the third point, Lord willing, uh, about why this difference between six-day man and Adam and Eve. And the key to understanding this is what God impressed on me, because when I heard of this doctrine um, not too long ago, uh, I put it to prayer, you know, I put it to prayer and sought guidance, sought illumination on it, and uh, God did not disappoint. (laughs) Uh, He gave me an understanding on this, Um, but don't take my word for it, (laughs) you know, look at these scriptures yourself as good Bereans. You know, this is not a heaven or hell issue. So if we, uh, you know, uh, agree to disagree, that's fine. Um, But I'm convinced, uh, you know, even though for a long time I just believed the narrative. um, But let me not get ahead of myself. Eight distinctions between Adam and six-day man. And these eight distinctions cannot be explained away. You know, they cannot be answered uh, by those who want to see it all as one uh, story, okay, as one narrative. So, between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, we have mankind being spoken of in general, and the Hebrew word is Adam, versus Adam and Eve, who are specifically referred to. So in Genesis chapter 1, it's mankind in general. Whenever you see the word Adam there, or man, whenever you see in in the English, (laughs) whenever you see in the English the word man, it's referring to Adam, which is in Hebrew, which is uh, mankind in general. But 
you know, but Adam has the, you know, Adam uh, is referred to directly as his name, you know, in uh, Genesis chapter 2. So that's the first distinction. And number two, there's a different emphasis on the mode of creation. Now, no one else, well, that's not true. I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> there's a difference, different emphasis on the mode of creation. In, in Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve are spoken of as being created and made. And these are very specific Hebrew words. Whereas in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is spoken of as being formed. Okay, formed. Um, now, we see all three words for made, for uh, created, formed, and made. Uh, all three of the same Hebrew words, which are, by the way, bara, yetzar, and asa, uh, respectively. And all three of these Hebrew words that are used between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are used in reference to the creation of man or in reference to man in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. Okay. This is a very important uh, text. <clears throat> and it says, Isaiah 43, 7. Every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. Created is bara. I have formed him, yatsar. Yea, I have made him, asa. And my understanding, I could get into now, my understanding of the differences between the two narratives between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, was that this was mankind being um, created, if you will, on different planes of being. And there's truth to that. There's truth to that. Uh, there's <clears throat> three worlds we can discuss. One where creation takes place. A world where formation takes place. Even the divine imagination, right? Uh, creation is the divine intention or, you know, God's faith. You know, um, we're not going to get too deep into this. But I have a whole mystical approach that I have developed based on this. But uh, that'll be a sermon for another day. And then you have the word made, asa, in Hebrew. And that is the world of manifestation, even our uh, four-dimensional plane uh, this world, this, this uh, spatial, physical world, the natural realm, as we can call it, the natural realm. That is the world of making. That is uh, asa, the world where things are made. That is, they come into being. That is, they, uh, they manifest. You know, they manifest on this plane, okay? So between those three worlds, Adam and Eve and mankind in general were made okay and there's different reasons for the emphasis of these things but that is a distinction between genesis 1 six day man and genesis 2 adam and eve is that man in general six day man was created whereas <clears throat> adam and eve were formed okay you know and uh I believe all three things occur for all of them, but, but this is the emphasis of the Holy Spirit between these two narratives, okay? Number three. Day six, we saw multiple couples made. Male and female created he them. On day eight, we see Adam and Eve made. <clears throat> But because they're all mankind, they're compatible sexually, okay? 
And this answers a very important point, you know, where did Cain get his wife from? You know, we learn in Genesis chapter 4 that uh, uh, Cain was banished from the presence of the Lord. And, you know, they were all out of Eden at this point. But Cain was banished from the presence of the Lord. And he became um, a vagabond or he became like, kind of like a fugitive. <coughs> Excuse me. And he marries his wife. He builds a city. He dwells in the land of Node, uh, which is how it's pronounced in the Hebrew. He dwells in the land of Node and builds a city and has children. Okay. Cain. Where did Cain get his wife? So most people say, well, you know, God kind of had to wink at incest at first. Um, you know, because we read in Leviticus 18.9, okay, now this is a very, very important point that we need, need to make note of here. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to Levit uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 9. It says, The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. So a lot of scholars say, well, <clears throat> the law against incest, you know, is to prevent genetic mutations in the species. Because we all know and, you know, perhaps joke about, you know, inbred folk, uh, you know, up in them hills, right? Um, they married their sister or their, co their cousin and had children, and they were born with some kind of uh, birth defect or, you know, were weakened somehow. And it's true that such inbreeding causes uh, genetic mutations. <clears throat> but is that the only reason why God included this in the Torah, in the law? Is this the only, and, and God kind of winked at it uh, when it came to Cain and his sister, <laughs> who we would think was his sister. But was she his sister? Okay, so now let's just go a couple chapters over in Leviticus again. Where we see this law repeated, but but uh, with an interesting emphasis. Okay, twenty and verse seventeen. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness. And she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his iniquity. Okay, so that's pretty serious. Here we see incest being called wickedness. God forbid... And I doubt that anyone can show in the Bible where God winked at or allowed um, the wickedness to occur without it being wicked, without it being sinful, without it being uh, judged or damnable or you know, worthy of condemnation. Okay, so... The creation of six-day man was of multiple couples, you know, male and female created he them, okay? Whereas he created Adam by himself on the eighth day, by himself, and he created Eve a little later out of his side. But here in Genesis chapter 1, male and female created he them. So when Cain uh, was kicked out of the presence of the Lord, you know, after he killed his brother Abel, 
He marries his wife. You know, he marries a wife. He settles in, in a place called Node, which means in the Hebrew wandering. Okay. Remember the injunction God gave to six-day man. Uh, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Take dominion over the earth, over all the creatures of it. Right? Fill the earth. You know, replenish the earth. So this land of wandering beyond where Adam and Eve and his family were, were the six-day man wandering, you know, the land of Node. And Adam gets his wife from there. I'm sorry, not Adam. Cain gets his wife from there. And so the problem of incest is solved. It wasn't because God was simply trying to avoid genetic mutation but God never had to compromise on what he himself calls wickedness, what he himself calls iniquity. So God had never at one time allowed wickedness or allowed uh, iniquity and later uh, made a law against it. God forbid. You know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, behold, I change not, the Bible says. Okay. There is neither shadow of turning. And if you say he allowed incest at one time and another time condemns it as wickedness, that would show a shadow of turning in God. God forbid. Okay? All right. We're going through eight distinctions between Adam and six-day man. And now we're on number... Four, okay? Locations are assigned. Different locations are assigned. As we hinted on already. Chapter 1, verse 28. Mankind, six-day man, is given the dominion over all the earth. To subdue it. To take dominion over all the animals. Whatever they wanted to do with the, them. Make them farm animals or whatnot. Uh, later on, they'll eat them. Okay? Um, uh and they were to replenish the earth. They were to um, marry each other. You know, the couples, male and female, were to marry, uh, as Adam and Eve did. And they were to replenish the earth, okay? And so that was the location of their, uh, that was their assignment. Whereas Eden was assigned to, um, to Adam and Eve. You know, God placed man in the Garden of Eden to keep and to dress it. So you see two different spheres of assignment. Six-day man, the face of the earth. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. Okay? Which I believe was located uh, where the modern-day Persian Gulf is. That's another sermon. But that's where the Tigris and the Euphrates River kind of meet up, you know, uh, there, where that body of water is now, uh, I believe the Garden of Eden was there geographically, but it also exists in another dimension. You know, Paul, the apostle, was caught up into paradise, you know, uh, and Eden means different things, you know, on different levels of being or different worlds, different dimensions. Um, we touched on that a little bit uh, in a previous video, uh, you know, on Lucifer and his fall, uh, because his planet was called Eden, you know, as well. Um, but, but we see two different loci of activity there. Um, the, fifth, the fifth difference is the commands given, okay? The tasks given, you know, what mankind was told to do, you know, uh, as we've mentioned already. And what Adam was told to do, which was to keep and to dress the garden. Those are two different uh, commands that six-day man was given in chapter 1, and Adam and Eve, eighth-day man, were given in Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Number six, there's a different order of creation. Uh, between verses 25 and 26, we see that... Um, the animals were formed or created before uh, mankind was in Genesis chapter 1. 
And also we have vegetation and, and, and birds uh, created before and marine life created before mankind. But in, in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19, we see a reversal of that. Let me just read that verse <clears throat> briefly. Chapter 1. Shouldn't be hard to find, right? First chapter in the Bible. <laughs> okay. Or chapter 2. We're actually going to chapter 2 and verse 19. Uh, talking about the order of creation. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. This is after Adam and Eve, or Adam at least. This is before Adam was formed. In verse 7. So uh, over 10 verses later. 12 verses later, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. That's another mini distinction we could kind of point out is uh, in chapter 1, marine, the fowl life follows marine life or aquatic life or however you want to say it. In chapter 2, Fowl life follows mer uh, animal life or ter uh, earthly life or the, the physical life, <laughs> the, um, the opposite of marine life, right? Uh, land, the, mer the animals that, you know, are from the land, surf and turf, right? So turf life. <laughs> um, so that's a little mini distinction there as well. So then they're brought to Adam to see what he would name them at that point. And there was not a helpmeet found for Adam. And so Eve is formed after that. Okay. Okay, two more points. The seventh point, the seventh distinction between six-day man and Adam and Eve, or Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2, is that mankind, it kind of relates to the first point I made, but, but there's, uh, but it's interesting, you know, mankind is referred to in general terms in chapter one and in verse, and in chapter two, he's specifically named. And the same is true of God, okay? So this is definitely uh, a distinction that we want to make note of. You know, before we made the first distinction was between mankind in general versus Adam and Eve. Okay, so it's a similar distinction, but but mankind goes unnamed in chapter one, and he's named in chapter two, and so also is God, because in chapter one um, it is Elohim, God is Elohim, and in chapter 2, it is Elohim Yahweh. I have a different way of pronouncing that divine name, but between Elohim and Yahweh. Elohim Yahweh is, is his name given in chapter 2. So not only is man named in chapter 2 as Adam, but so too is God. Okay, that's an interesting distinction there. The eighth and final distinction between six-day man and Adam and Eve, or Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, is what's referred to in the Hebrew as toledoth, toledoth. And it literally means generations. These are the generations of, okay? And how it reads in, um, in, in the uh, English, you almost think that it's beginning as a specific section. <laughs> These are the generations of thus and so, and you expect to read more about it, but it seems to abruptly shift gears on you. <laughs> That's because 
Whenever Toledot is used, it's pointing backwards to the past narrative, and then it kind of sums up that section of Scripture. And there are um, 11 uses of Toledot in Genesis alone, and a 12th use of Toledot if we give Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 uh, a hearing there. And that, you know, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 points back to all over the whole Old Testament as these are the generations of Jesus Christ, okay? Um, <clears throat> but the Toledot in Genesis each point backwards to the narrative before it. So, so when it says in uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 of Genesis... These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. Okay, So that points backwards all the way to Genesis 1.1. So, um, you know, we're not going to go over that sermon again at this time, but, <laughs> but it includes all of that. Okay. And it culminates here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4. You know, God's done talking about all that, okay? So after his Sabbath, he sums it all up by saying, Toledoth, the ending. You know, the generation, these are the generations ending, you know, here, okay? <laughs> up to this point is where we're at, okay? Everything behind us is what we're discussing now. So isn't it interesting that Adam and Eve are, are, uh, have their own Toledoth, separate from the creation of six-day man? And that we find in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, where God specifically points back from Genesis 2, 5 and on, which includes the formation of Adam and Eve, but he's also um, he's also lifting up Adam. You know, let me read it. Genesis chapter five and verse one says, "This is the book of the generations of Adam." The name Adam. In the day that God created man, Adam, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Okay, so we saw already that mankind in general is Adam. So there's Adam's name right there. But <clears throat> Genesis 5 1 points all the way back to Genesis 2 uh, 5 to include Adam and Eve's formation. But God then says, this is what I want mankind to be. Okay, I already created mankind in the previous chapter on day six. The Sabbath passed. This is the generations of the heavens and the earth. You know, this is, uh, you know, where we are now. You know, but, but when he creates Adam and Eve, he says, this is what I want mankind to be like. I will name mankind after Adam. I will name mankind after Adam. And there's powerful overtones and truths here that I hope to be able to get to. So if, you know, if we have to make a second video, we'll make a second video. But um, I hope to cover everything now. Um, second point I want to make is uh, three objections, okay? The first objection is that in 1 Corinthians 15, 40, and verse 45, it calls, it says of Adam, let me just read it. Okay. Okay. 
And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, right? So someone can point to that verse to object to this and say, you know, Adam is the first man, Adam, as the New Testament calls him. But the word, the Greek word used there for first is protos, which is used um, as the first in terms of like time or place or rank. And the word that God did not use in 1 Corinthians 15.45 was arche, you know, where, you know, which is, would be the Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint for Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens of the earth, arche, or uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word RK is used, you know. Um, that would be for like source, origin, the root. Um, and so, Adam is not the origin of mankind. Adam is not the root of mankind. Adam is not the first in that sense. He is not the beginning of mankind, Adam. But he is the protoss of mankind because he called their name Adam, as it says in Genesis chapter 5, okay, in verse 1. So God chose to name mankind after Adam, and he gave Adam the special place on planet Earth in the Garden of Eden to keep and to dress the garden, whereas he gave six-day man uh, free reign everywhere else, and they had the land of Nod. And um, Cain, you know, got kicked out of the of uh, his family, <coughs> and he married his wife, and he built a city in the land of Node. Okay, wandering. <clears throat> the second objection that can be raised is that Adam himself, in Genesis chapter three and verse twenty, calls Eve the mother of all living. Okay. <clears throat> and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. But here we have in mind, <clears throat> as in all nature, she is the mother of all living. You know, we, we, uh, we have the concept um, Mother Nature, you know. And we've always seen nature as, a, as feminine, as female, right? Um, but he names his wife Eve, you know, the mother of all living. And it doesn't say all living mankind. It doesn't say she's the mother of all living people, but that she's the mother of all living, full stop. So she's like mother nature to him, okay? And, you know, like, you know, uh, you'll see this play out in the different religions uh, of the world, which all took a piece of some truth from the Tower of Babel, something that mankind understood uh, collectively or uh, as any given family. Uh, they all took a piece of the tradition and, and the truths uh, however, it got distorted later on, okay? But, you know, we have, um, you know, Mother Nature. We have, you know, in the Navajo, uh, they, we have a changing woman, uh, you know, and, and you have these different uh, feminization of nature that take place, okay? Um, I think that this is what that points to. And, <clears throat> but furthermore, okay, and this is important, we want to see that Deborah, the judge named Deborah, in Judges chapter 5 and verse 7, she's called a mother in Israel. You shall be a mother in Israel. Okay, So she had this, this authority as, as a woman, as a mother, and she became a mother to several people in Israel as their judge. Okay, So she's a mother in Israel. 
Then the New Jerusalem, the Bible says, in uh, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26, it says that the New Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. The New Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. You know, all of us who believe, right? Um, <clears throat> Babylon, <laughs> contrary, contrary wise, uh, in Revelation 17 and verse 5, Babylon is called the mother of harlots and of all abominations on the earth. So when you have the term mother, it means different things. So Eve being called the mother of all living doesn't necessarily mean that she was the first woman. Okay. Um, you know, certainly all the progenitors alive now can point to Eve because of all, all the uh, six-day men have, have, uh, did not survive the flood. So uh, certainly that's true, um, you know, because we're all from Noah and Noah's from Eve, you know, through Seth. So <clears throat> finally, for the objection, uh, Christ seems to link together Genesis 1, 27, and chapter 2 and verse 24 in uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 5. So let me go there. Okay. Jesus is answering uh, the Pharisees who are trying to excuse uh, their nonchalant approach to divorce. He says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Okay, so this verse here from the mouth of Jesus is the only clear thing that seems to link Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 together, but it doesn't necessarily make them one narrative or one event because the same is true for the pre-Adamites as we saw out of Mark uh, when, I, when uh, we taught that on that. That, you know, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. And it's true anyway. You know, God, um, God did not change the rules.